Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the Riptide. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. Brewers, it's time for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. I'm Jamil Zainashev. I'm Travis Gobble. And I'm Mike Persign, and you're listening to Brew Strong. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a sort of uh, like a you know, voice modulator thing that uh, gives you uh, some sort of echoey, echoey thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Only when I say Brew Strong, or is it the whole time? A nice <laughs> reverb on Brew Strong. Yeah, like only the bridge strong. I don't know. I got a foot pedal down here. You don't? No, I don't have a foot pedal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to mention again that uh, Blickman is retiring. Our dear friend who has sponsored the show for the last 16 years, so you don't have to pay for it. Um, still, you can send a nice uh, message to him at feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Tell him how much you've appreciated him being around and innovating uh, brewing gear for, for oh so many years. And uh, making your brew day happier and prettier and better. Uh, you know, check them out. Uh, if, you know, they're still going to be in business and still going to be, you know, creating uh, amazing things and hopefully still paying for this show, you know, please. And, uh, uh, you know, they got commercial gear that you can buy there if you're moving into the commercial. Yeah, they got everything. They got, they got the works. Just check them out. BlickmanEngineering.com. Anyways. We're going to hold a retirement party for him up in uh, North Tahoe at Alibi Ale Works. And there's a long story where if, you, if you're if you a listener, you would remember the competition or the uh, the drawing we had where Blickman and I and uh, John Palmer went out to brew with Kevin Drake uh, in his home in Kings Beach. And then, lo and behold, Ke- <laughs> Kevin opened Alibi Ale Works, which is now one of the finest uh, breweries in, in, in the region. And uh, so we're going to have a party there, May 4th, uh, 2024, uh, Alibi Ale Works in, in uh, North Tahoe there. And uh, just get, watch the social media and uh, you'll find out the deets. But Blickman will be there. I'll be there. Palmer will be there. Mike will be there. Uh, Justin Crosley will be there. Blickman will be there. Uh, Kim Drake will be there. It's going to be a blast. Uh, also, people have been asking for Bruce Strong gear. Uh, it, since you asked, I have delivered. You can find it at, uh, at, on Etsy, uh, in the Mr. Malty store, uh, M R M A L T Y store, uh, etsy.com slash shop slash Mr. Malty. Uh, find it there. Buy your gear. Be cool. Hey, <laughs> just like this. Uh, uh, hey, we're in strong now. It's a sweet logo. I was going to say, like Travis, it. didn't you post the link on, on Facebook or did yeah, that come did. down? Oh. Uh, it should be in the chat for this uh, show. Yeah, there you go. So don't even have to look. It's right there. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what else do I have? What else do I have? Uh, I don't know. I think that's it. Unless either of you have something special to say. I will be going to Vegas as part of a conference, but I fully plan on... Checking out some cool breweries down there. Nice. But in the chat, if you have any recommendations for me, I want to check out. I'll be there four days. I'm figuring I can probably hit three or four, you know, just get a little check in well, before I go to sleep because I got to be up in the morning for these conferences for my professional life. But definitely want to check it out. So if you got any you big can, ones. You, you can have the most amazing time. You got to get in contact with Snafu, which is yeah, the Southern yeah, Nevada yeah, yeah. Union of Fermentation, Bale whatever. Fermenters Union or something. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, they are, um, wonderful folks, known a lot of them for a, a long period of time. Uh, I went out there, uh, about a year ago and, uh, met up with a bunch of them at, uh, we started at the Silver Stamp, which is 
got to be the best beer bar in all of Las Vegas, probably in all of Nevada. It is freaking fantastic. The the beer menu is wonderful. They right. curate a great beer menu. It's a great vibe in there. The owners are wonderful. The crowd's wonderful. So you start yourself at the, the, at the silver stamp. The silver stamp. And that's where my memory gets a little fuzzy. And then, <laughs> so uh, the names of the breweries we went to from there, um, gosh, uh, you can you can walk from there to. Um, <laughs> it is fuzzy. <laughs> it's fuzzy, <laughs> all right? It's tough. Yes. Well, I'm working there. on good tips for uh, Mike. I'll, I'll let you know. My big plans are to hang out in the Houston metro area where I live and continue to drink beer. That's what I do. Yes, nice. there, there, there's a ton of breweries there. They have kind of like a brewery row. Voodoo in Brewing. Vegas? Yes. I think it's uh, called the Craft- Arts District or something like that. Yes, it's the Arts yeah. District. So Craft House uh, has got some great beer. Uh, that's not their brewery there, but uh, there's Hop Nuts and oh, Neon Desert. Uh, yeah, it's great as well. Was- yes. Um, so it's temporarily closed. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> you get... Wow. But Neon Desert was was good. Uh, Craft Test is, is great. Um, uh, I did not go to Hop Nuts. Um, but there's, there's, there's a number. Like Huddle or something. And then there's uh, Abel Maybe. Baker. And the- yes. But the, the the place to start is the Silver Stamp. Silver Stamp. Uh, gotcha. 222 East Imperial Avenue, Las Vegas. It's, uh, fantastic folks. Fantastic beers. Uh, check them out. Uh, you won't be disappointed. And again, get hold of the folks at Snafu. Probably I will. I do know those guys too. Media. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we, uh, we do a Nevada State Homebrew Competition every year, and it's Snafu is always taking home more medals than everybody. But we're small, but we 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 give it our all. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Up here champ. In little Reno, yeah, Buckaroo, yeah, we're you little go. guys. So, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, let everybody know. I'm sure you know a lot of the listeners would. Uh, Enjoy meeting up with you out there if if they get a chance. Uh, just don't embarrass the very strong, uh, uh, you know, crew. Because I'll do us all good. Yes, you have to. Yes, and if not, I will deny that I am the person I am. <laughs> you wear your Bruce Strong gear, and when you get too drunk, you just take it off. Yeah, and then everyone just, just knows you're drunk and not Bruce Strong. This is essentially you know, what, you have no shirt what, on. Yeah. what Travis and I did. <laughs> At Sandbrook's, meeting up with the, the lab uh, uh, homebrew club. Yeah. We yes. ended up switching shirts <laughs> with other people. That shirt was way too skinny for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look like you're my size. You want my shirt? I'll take yours. Oh, man. I wish I was yeah. there for that. Yeah. There were, we were, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, oh, Ryan Collins. He's listening. Uh, we were, uh, Sean was, Extra generous with the the taps there at Sam Brooks, and he just kept pouring. And we had to try every beer a couple of couple times. times. And, and when we say try, we mean have a pint. And so uh, we we were we were having a wonderful time. Anyways, nice. uh, let's 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 get on with the show. Let's uh, let's let's get uh, let's get cracking here. We got some interesting questions. Uh, actually, here we'll do it this way since we're all feeling good. A little thank you from uh, from Sean. Uh, Sean says, a different Sean, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate everything you do for the brewing industry. You uh, took me from a listener to an all-grain brewer with confidence. I have had great success because I had great instruction. I can't say it enough. Thank you. Have a great day. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, Sean. We appreciate it. We appreciate that, uh, you know, uh, you found the information useful. Uh, because without it being useful to somebody, we are just wasting time here. So blowing uh, hot air. Uh, very much appreciate that. All right, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we will have some of your questions right after this. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. 
Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20 gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. You listen to Brew Strong. We are talking uh, live Q&A here. We're answering your questions. Uh, Ryan wants to know, what's up, guys? Uh, yeah. Chilling. Hey, same. Well, hey, sorry. Ryan. Podcasting. Uh, what's up? What's up, Ryan? I first met Ryan in Idaho, I think. Very cool. Uh, tasted his uh, Russian Imperial Stout, and then we brewed it at Heretic. It was a blast. Uh, let's see. See, I still have some brain cells at work. I still have memory things. You almost hear them kind of snapping. Yeah, we can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> that's something else that's going on. Uh, <laughs> guidance on using final runnings for a mini mash. Uh, Charles asks, I have recently done a few all grain brews in which I use the final runnings to make a small batch of offspring beer. Uh, using what is essentially a mini mash method with DME to get the desired gravity. In each case, I collected about five quarts of wort with gravity in the range of 1012 to 1014, added around one half pound DME, and boiled down to three quarters of a gallon into the fermenter. Each of these beers has turned out very nice, with a good malt character reminiscent of the parent all grain batch, but distinctly different thanks to in a large part to the hop and yeast selections. It does extend the brew day with the additional boil, etc. But since it is such a small batch, the extra time is not a big issue to me. Uh, And I like the opportunity to do a little experimental variation with relatively little effort. The only problem is that there doesn't seem to be much shared knowledge out there regarding any changes in the character of the runnings over time. That is, does the balance between sugars, dextrins, proteins, etc., change over the course of the sparge louder? Also, is there a good way to determine the expected gravity and color using any recipe calculation program? I can make a reasonable guess doing the calcs by hand, but it would be nice to include these in my software. For what it's worth, I batch sparge, usually collecting two equal size runnings for my main beer and use a smaller sparge for the final runnings. Thanks. Yeah, this is a fortified party gal, right? Mm hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, party gal with a Y. Oh, she's got it. Yeah. I, my software, I, if it does it, I haven't tried to, to predict the party gal. I mean, I, my, my current system, I, I have almost nothing left in the grain after I use a brew in a bag in an anvil foundry. And so I'm getting the best efficiency I can into my boil, not into my dripping out of the mash afterwards. So I, I can't advise on predicting what's left personally. I have not done a party gal. I, I, I was just kind of go like what Travis was saying, get the max sugars. And then as far as I understand those last, last runnings, you don't want when they're below a certain Play-Doh because it's extracting tannins and your pH is shooting way up. Right. Again. So you'd have to plan for it. Right. And, and, Split the yeah. batch at a certain point. I haven't tried that yet. So I think you want to keep your pH from rising too high. Uh, and as long as you do, um, mm-hmm. you can go pretty low. I think um, it should get more organic, I guess. Um, and I don't know that you're necessarily extracting more tannins at that point. 
unless the, the pH is going up. Okay, but, sure, the, sure the but rather, changes. Exactly. So the, um, you know, the amount of, you know, the other malt compounds that you have, the sugars and all that, that you're extracting, you maybe you're extracting the same amount of tannins. I don't know, but there's less of ev- anything else to really balance it out. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes more tannic uh, over time, uh, you know, as, as you get thinner and thinner. So, yeah, the, the amount of sugars uh, do change. The amount of proteins probably change. Everything probably changes um, as as you as you you know run run more water through your through your grain bed. Can you guys think of an, an American brewer, brewery that puts out a two beer series of you know primary, secondary, alpha party gal? I mean, in England, it's very common, right? But here, yeah, for example, like Fuller's, where they yeah you know they collect this, they collect that, and then they blend, and yeah, it's kind of a standard thing. So you could walk in and have that and understand for yourself what this brewery does. And that's the differences. And I, I just don't, I knew this guy that used to have a pro brewery that probably could have done it, but you know. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm not aware of any American breweries that are doing it, yeah. but uh, uh, there might be some, you know, if, if, if so, let us know. We might, yeah. uh, might actually have you on the show to uh, find out uh, what you're doing and, and how it turns out. That would be, that would be fun. I would say though, what do you, I mean, maybe his problem with finding any kind of research is that he isn't searching that term party guile. And I don't know if he, do, he probably, do, I, maybe I'm being, uh, bit, you know, wrong here, but that's maybe where there's plenty of literature on that. So there you go. You know, our, our, our special guest, Neil, who didn't make it today, he could talk <laughs> on party guile for days, I bet. Yeah. And really educate, uh, Charles, who hopefully Charles is still brewing eight, eight, nine and a half years later. Hey. Hey, good luck to you there, Charles. Let's see. Ryan is asking, I'm making a New Zealand Pilsner. When is the best time to add dry hops? I'm using thialized lager yeast. I typically let hops set for 48 hours and then drop out my conical. Is this best done at diacetyl rest or after? I just do not want to drop out my yeast too quickly. Thanks for everything. I'm a cold dry hopper. I think with... uh loggers and pilsners and try hopped anything you're going to pull more fruit character and you're going to get more of these kind of fruity less green by letting it finish and then cooling to 60 and then adding your hops i will say i've heard a lot of research about haze and you can actually use hops as almost a clarifying addition if you add them right at uh knockout so basically like you you pitch them with your pitch just a little bit and it can actually help clear it up but i tried that with a West Coast, it worked really nice. So if you're looking for clear, I'm saying adding them at uh, a little bit in at uh, at the beginning of knockout and, and at the yeah, it's, it was in really the, cool in the, fer- in the fermenter or in the yeah when when they were discussing that haze forming protein or uh, yeast, the haze yeast, uh, they said that they noticed that early additions like first like for, like yeast pitch additions of, of hops had a, a clarifying effect if you had haze positive yeast and i don't know if pilsner has any haze positive characteristics maybe it does maybe it doesn't but the the cold dry hopping i've noticed can throw a very very strong colloidal haze and so i like doing that because of the flavors but if you're not looking for the haze you might think about that fer- that fermentation pitch addition just a tiny one like i did like an ounce <laughs> So, on a 10 gallon. So I, I live with this question on, you know, well, there's thialized yeast and there's more thialized yeast and then there's yeast that don't have to be thialized because they have it naturally. And it's like, how much of, of this do you need to get what you want out of your hops? Now, if, if he's waiting post diacetyl, that is at least still warm. So there's still yeast in suspension, but not, not but a fraction of the yeast in suspension. And now he's throwing in his hops, trying to get his Thialize effects in his hops. Has he waited yeah. too long for it to thialize those hops? I would do multiple additions personally, you know, before, during, and after probably. And, and I say would, I have, that's what I do. Um, but yeah, I think there's still a lot of magic out there on thialize, no matter how much I read about it. I just don't get to the bottom of it. Well, for me, if, if you're looking for thialization, you know, uh, I, I always look at, you know, what's in the whirlpool. I, I wouldn't, mm-hmm. wor- you know, be throwing dry hops in and expecting dialization. Huh. I'd be, you know, prepare your work properly with whatever hop compounds, you know, do a low, you know, a, a, a curl, a cool, 
cool world, as they say, mm-hmm. as the kids say nowadays, uh, you know, like 175, 170, 175 Fahrenheit uh, whirlpool. And you, you put your hops in there. And also, you know, there's, uh, you know, compounds uh, uh, that can be thialized, uh, you know, from the malt as well. So I think, right. you know, you, you set that up for success at the beginning. So you don't worry about that at the end. Do you skip the whirlpool to try to not give the flavors that are not thialized? I mean, I've seen recommendation on that, but I've never taken that step. I still, I, I'm sorry, not, not whirlpool. Do you skip the dry hop to keep from offsetting? The previously thialized hop uh, profile. I always still dry hop, but mm-hmm. I've seen things that say, well, I, I say I see things. Phantasm wants you to back off on your dry hop so you get more of the thialized effect. Yeah, yep. that's that's what the, the science is bearing out that mash hopping with high precursor hop varietals <laughs> yeah. like Saws or Cascade and then heavy whirlpools that with, again, selecting for hops that have high precursors and then... Uh, the dry hops are kind of, uh, you need to subdue them. Otherwise, they will hide all of the work you've done to make the thials. Um, so, yeah, that I was just commenting on when to dry hop. Yeah. I, he was right. not talking. Uh, I thought he wasn't asking about I'm trying to read it right now. But, is but yeah, so he was saying he's using or something. And Can he I? was saying I do mash hop quite a bit of, and of quite a bit of whirlpool. I've heard that too much hops can work against the yeast. Yeah. Well, can I say this? I really don't care for the thialized yeast. <laughs> The flavor. <laughs> Wait, you heard him, Mike. Send me your thialized beers, not him. Right. It's just like, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't care for that that flavor profile. It's, it's it can just, get samey. Yeah, it's it's just a little weird. It doesn't taste like anything normal in beer. Well, and that's like the the balance that I like to strike with any beer that I make, even hazies, is that if you go for the moon and they have these hops that are these yeast strains that are crazy with the, the, the thylization and then you're throwing phantasm in there. It's like, yeah, you're going to, the, the beer is not going to be balanced. Mm-hmm. And like you said, that flavor profile will become not good. So I, I always try to balance it out and I, I was messing around with my thylized yeast, but I like them to compliment, not to be the, right. the lead actor. <laughs> well, and you know, and I'm sure I'm going to get lots of hate mail now that, you know, Oh, you know, Jamel hates uh, anything that, you know, from, uh, you know, Omega or whatever. It's like, no, 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 that's not the case. It's not you know, style. It's, it's, it's similar to, well, it's similar to, you know, the early, uh, you know, NEPA efforts, you know, it was, um, you know, there was just a lot of bad ones and it was like, yeah, this is crap. Yeah. And then once people dialed it in it's like okay this is really good you know yeah. um yeah you know, i think the same things happen with the thialized yeast it's like eh, people are making some really crappy beers with it yeah that doesn't mean the the product's bad or you know the the technology or the tool is bad well, we're gonna assume that ryan is making great beer <laughs> with his thialized yeah. yeast people ryan, have, go ahead and send me the samples people have and, just not uh, quite dialed in you know how to do it best Everyone's just yeah. like, I want the most styles possible. <laughs> and that's what mo- 90% of people are doing. It's like, ah, you know, I just want, you know, styles, styles, styles. Yeah. And they're making crappy beer. Um, Again, Ryan, not but, you. Jamil's not talking about you. <laughs> I, uh, I would just like to say, I, yeah, seriously, I think, Ryan, send but, us some beer. You know, yeah. like, Mike, like Michael's saying, some balance, you know, mm-hmm. let's try and, you know, use this tool in a way that integrates well with the rest of the beer. And I'm sure there's some people that are making fantastic beers with it, but I'm rarely tasting those. So I'm, I'm not a fan at this good. point. Uh, I, I've used sure. all the yeast. I do uh, like them, sure. honestly. Uh-huh. 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 Uh, and, and you sent me how many of those? I don't know. How, I, many I, of mine did, how many of mine did you not like? That's how we figure out how many I sent you. <laughs> So, uh, so Ryan, to answer your question, seriously, um, if you're going for the thialized, bring your, bring your dry hop down, but go ahead and add it after your diastole rest when you know your beer is just about done. And I would think about, uh, yeah. I don't know too much about this Lunar Crush, but if that's one of the more aggressive thializing yeast, mm-hmm. you might want to think about doing a like a 50-50 that with some Chico or something that's going to have a lot less, you know, kind of balance it back, drop back, kind of give it a little bit of like mystery and like, hey... I can use this flavor because I want to push the passion fruit, but then with the hops, I'm going to go this way with like some Nelson would be great with a, a New Zealand Pilsner, which will have like that white wine, lemongrass. And you can kind of really develop this really cool beer 
that has great balance and, and flavor, but it's not just ah shit, bro, you know, like right in your face, like baked flavors, like it was a well, and it doesn't even really taste like passion fruit. It's it's kind of like a, a a fake thing, and I think that's why you know I I, I I don't like it when people use you know uh, artificial extracts, you know, fruit extracts or something in beer. Yeah, but if you're using real fruit. And then you're kind of missing a little, you know, you can use like a drop of, you know, artificial extract and it's like the whole thing together. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So I'm okay with that, you know, if it's used appropriately. So I, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think you had an excellent point, Michael, about, you know, balance and, and getting, getting the whole thing in, together. And uh, like Travis was saying, to answer the question, I'd wait until after, you know, uh, the diacetyl rest and then, you know, and then go from there. You know, right after that, yeah. or you know, go cold. Okay, I I think we we really answered that one. You are oh. going to get so much hate mail on this one, Jamil. Have we done a break yet? I don't think so. Damn it, we were supposed to do a break. Well, we did. Right. We did the first break at least. We did. Oh, that maybe. might be the I only. Can't remember. Okay. Yeah, no, you, 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 somebody somebody was thankful. At least one of the five yes. million people to listen. And then to then your we took a break. Thankful. <laughs> we took a break. Listener, right. listener I number forgot. two. It's my turn to forget. Okay, so. <laughs> Let's take break number two. Uh, you can tell we drink doing these shows. All right. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more right after this. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right. We're back. You're listening to Brew Strong, and the uh, the only reason I, I I keep doing this show, I think, is really because I have fun doing it. I, <laughs> I think you it's know, not the it's, it's not the paycheck. You know, although the new the new Lamborghini parked in the driveway, that's <laughs> yeah, pretty sweet. Do you but, look at your Do you look at your products around your house, Jamil, and say, "Yeah, that was five thousand hoodies right over there." Hell yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I'm just like, you know, I wish I wish I could shop at Walmart, you know, <laughs> but can't quite afford it at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How many mugs is it going to take to charge your leaf? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's see here. Uh, enough fun. We should be answering emails. Never enough. And again, if you have questions for the... Uh, uh, geniuses here at Bruce Strong. Seriously, we, we do answer them even when we're drunk. We answer them to the fullest. Uh, send your questions in to brewstrong at thebrewingnetwork.com and we get to all of them. I, you know, yes, some of these are from 10 years ago, but we're fully caught up on the, on the recent ones and we, we're, we will keep up on them. So if you send in a question, we'll probably get to it at the very next show. If not that, then the, the show after. It hasn't been going any longer than that, but Jamil. we're mixing in these old ones and get, uh, I'm going to answer every damn question that was sent yeah. in. Hey, the hey, one, the ones that are posted don't argue online, with me. The what? ones that are posted online. Yes. They're answered they instantly. Get answers. You're right. Oh yeah. If you watch the show, uh, like, like Ryan and, uh, Ezra and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh Jake and, uh, Brent and, uh, new and, uh, Catherine and Brent, uh, and Andrew. Uh, you get your questions answered right away. That's that easy. Uh, follow us on social media. And uh, when you see a show post, you can just jump on. Generally, we're doing Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you know, which Wednesday, that's going to change. But we're, we're, we're pretty much sticking with this day and time to try and keep this consistent for you folks. Uh, it was at least four days, four, four, sorry, four hours notice this time. At least four hours notice today. <laughs> well, I, I'm like, well, I could post it days earlier, but. I know our listeners drink, and so they're not going to remember that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that we're going to do a show. So I'm like, I might as well just do it right before we go on because that's their best chance of actually remembering, right? Yeah. yeah. Or should I and post it earlier? Logic is sound. Logic I, could, is sound. I could post it like two weeks earlier and then remind them. Uh, how do I remind them? I go back to my post and post a reply. Keep sharing online. your post hey. to your story and like whatever. I don't know what the TikTokers do, but. I don't I'm even old. know if we do that. I'm also yeah, I don't, I don't know what, the, what they do the, on the TikTok or the Facebook. Yeah. I could try. Or the Instagram. I don't know. 
Somebody else, somebody else needs to do this. I'm I'm gonna just look like it up that on. one will tag me and one will tag Mike and one <laughs> will tag Jamil, but none will tag all three of us. I, I, that's what I like, you know? Well, all right. Here's the problem is you guys don't have like any sort of standard amongst your, your three social media. I don't even know if Mike's on uh, like Instagram or, yeah, yeah. or Twitter. I tag him. Uh, well, mm-hmm. all right. You share with me what your what all your right. handle I'll is send on it to these you after this because <laughs> because I yeah. can't post find it. A comment responding to your post and they tag Mike Persai. <laughs> well, there you go. Hey, I don't look at them. Once I post them, I don't look. I'm not Throw on away. these things. I don't. I don't look at any of this stuff. <laughs> I just posted to help the help out the guy. Hey, hey, I had enough of you. All right. Quiet. We've got, we've got questions to answer. What have you been drinking? Uh, adding heat. Robert asks, <clears throat> Robert from, uh, Philly. Uh, Rob, Rob Philly says, guys, I'm thinking about brewing a porter and would like Ooh. to spice it up a bit with my homegrown ghost peppers. I threw, I threw this question in for you, Travis. Mm-hmm. Uh, with these peppers, it's easy to go overboard. I would like advice on how to get the right amount of space in the beer. Space? It says space. I know what it says. (laughs) The expert is saying... You're like Ron Burgundy, where you just read exactly what the teleprompter is. (laughs) At this point, yes. Cyrus, Mike. (laughs) (laughs) Right amount of spice in the beer, five gallons, without willy-nilly throwing them in there. I purchased some porters and made a ghost pepper vodka. I put one mil into one, sipped it, and then added more until it tasted great. Figured out the math, cracked how much into five gallons. I did a few other things, <laughs> and I came back to the beer and got no heat. When I got to the end of the glass, it was hotter than the devil's ass. The only conclusion I can come to is that vodka is denser than beer, and after sitting, sank to the bottom. Now, if I were to do this method... The first few pints of my keg would kill you, and the rest would be plain porter. Do you have any recommendations to add a measured clo- dose into a beer, or is it just trial and error? Feels, feel free to summarize if you ask around. Rob was drinking. Yeah, all of us are. Um, you know, generally the the you know tincture blends up well. I mean, yeah. it, it, did you not mix it in well? I don't know because vodka will alcohol has quite an affinity for water, which is most of beer. So it blends in really well if you use vodka and uh, you know just mix it in well. The thing that I always did uh, is that I would you know do the math and I would go like, all right, here's You know, here's the amount that we need to do. And then I would go, I'd add like three quarters or, you know, five sixths of the amount to the, to the beer, shake it up, taste it and see if it needed the rest of it, just in case, you know, just in case some of the measurements were off, you know, because you can always add a little bit more, but you add too much and backing off requires brewing a whole nother beer. All right. So. So yeah, Travis, you're you're the the pepper guy. Um, tell us, you know, how would you go about it? What what do you think is is the right technique here? I would do what you're saying, and 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 I am a pepper guy. I'm not a pepper beer guy. And Jamil, you are a pepper beer guy. I mean, you had pepper beer festival. That's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I sent you peppers for it and so forth. But you had a pepper beer festival, and as you said, and and Mike probably doesn't even want to say it. Alcohol in no form, like vodka, is not lighter than, not sorry, not heavier than beer, uh, unless there were solids involved. Mm-hmm. Right? Right, um, right. Perhaps the tincture was maybe he ground up the ghost peppers into a powder yeah. and maybe he got some powder that settled. Didn't filter it out, something like that. Could there have been maybe just a, like if he doesn't mix it? And I've always heard that capsaicin doesn't really dissolve in water. That's why water doesn't help you when you're. Yeah. So. But, it dissolves it might in alcohol. Be, it does dissolve in alcohol. So then right. that's where I'm not really sure about all that. And the, I will the say alcohol that, bonds to water. Well, yeah. yeah. Huh. Makes an emulsification. Point. I don't know. I mean, that would be a hell of an emulsification. Be a lot of spicy. So I, I've had some uh, friends that do spice beers. And, and yeah, I, the ones that have done it where they try to do it in the brewery or in the fermentation, it never really has a lot of spice. So I think he's on the right track with trying to adjust mm-hmm. it on the finished beer. I would think if you're worried about mixing, maybe... 
you're adding to your fermenter and then transferring. So all that shaking and uh, mixing when you're sending it through the lines and into the keg, you get a good mix. But then I like what Jamil said, where you kind of, you know, you get, get five sixths of the way there and then check it and make sure it's mm-hmm. not too much. I was dosed in the, in the keg. Did you have a problem with separating Jamil? No. I mean, if it did separate, worst case, the oil, which capsaicins and oil, would float on top. Right. Which means that last pint, when that would be the gas burner. Right. And well, that's where I would be think trash. the is kind of beer. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing it in the fermenter. Are you saying during fermentation or did you wait till it was finished? No, I, I, I'd go into the corner, corny keg. Yeah. And, okay. And, uh, with the finished beer, right. I'd make yeah. a tincture and add it to there. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. You know, same thing. Because that would mix it too. And I, I don't think he's going to have a problem as long as he gets I mean, a good mix. At Heretic now, granted, it's not quite as as hot a beer, but we did a uh, habanero uh, beer called uh, Primo Diablo. And it's essentially uh, our uh, evil cousin, double IPA, with, uh, you know, habanero extract. And so we would. Habanero extract and and we'd throw in some uh or the non hot habaneros. Oh, it's a handful of them. Yeah, the uh Texan AM makes one New, New Mexico. Uh, oh, the one th- you know which ones we ended up using. I ended up getting the seeds and growing them. Well, I sent you so many options, I wasn't sure which one actually worked out. <laughs> Anyways, but we would make a tincture uh with those and then you know just dose, dose the kegs with it. And it was the same pint for pint for pint. Or, yeah, sometimes we dose the fermenter too. But it, it, at the end of the you day, know, you're dosing when it, it was then, done. You're dosing it and then filling that keg, right? Yeah, yeah. So you get all that mixing action it's, when yeah. you're filling it. Yeah, and we we bubble some CO two through. And I, you know, we we really didn't notice uh, the heat changing very much. So I don't know. I don't know what the what the issue could have been for for Rob. I bet the seeds that worked for you were the New Mexico State University seeds because they were they were developing two or three different uh was it Suave or something? What yes. Was it? Yeah, NMSU Suave or New Mex Suave, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. They were excellent. A tremendous uh habanero flavor and uh no heat. And so we use those with the full hot uh habaneros and it worked out great. Uh all right. Um Rob, another Rob? Different Rob? I don't know. Fellas, can you do a show about scaling beer recipes? I know Jamel has touched on it in the past, but I think many of us would appreciate a more thorough discussion. Almost every recipe out there is for five gallons, but what if you want to do one, two and a half, 10, 20, 30 gallons? How do ratios of base malts to other malts and steeping grains change? Does the ratio of hops stay consistent, i.e. does two ounces in a five gallon recipe equal eight ounces in a 20 gallon recipe? Do you still need to boil for 60 or 90 minutes? Do you need to mash for more or less time? Uh, what are some best practices and pitfalls to avoid? I ask because personally, I want to make two to two and a half gallons at a time in order to brew more frequently and get better without costing me a ton of money. Making five gallons at a time would be more beer than I can drink and I want to pay for. But as Jamel says, I also want to make more than five gallons of some bigger beers that I can keep in kegs for a long time, like Russian Imperial Stouts, Barley Ones, etc. Thanks and brew strong, Rob. Yeah, really what I've discovered over, over you know, the past, you know, going from commercial size recipes down to homebrew for Can You Brew It, going from homebrew recipes up to commercial size recipes for uh, Pro-Ams and for, you know, Heretic and for other things. It's simple, straight math. Just to multiply or divide, it is consistent that the thing that changes is the equipment you're using. So 20 gallons is four times the ingredients that five gallons is, really is. What happens is, you know, the fermenter ge- geometry changes. Look at, you know, listen to the previous show if if you want to learn about that. So uh, fermenter geometry changes, or, you know, you get to you know, you're brewing, now brewing, uh, you know, a thousand gallons, you know, cause you're, you, you won the, the pro-am competition. You're brewing a thousand gallons of your five gallon batch and it's in a tall fermenter. You know, you, you need to, you know, up the heat a little bit uh, on fermentation in order to, you know, get the same ester profile. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, uh, you know, hop utilization, it's the hop utilization doesn't, doesn't change. It's, 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 physics, chemistry, whatever it might be, <laughs> you know, the hops are the same. Uh, boiling is the same. 
Uh, what happens in commercial breweries sometimes is that you know, they have a calandria where they're really not boiling very hard, but the calandria is, you know, violently throwing things. So it mixes a lot better. It's the mixing. It's not that they're doing a different heat or anything like that. It's that the, the, the words being mixed more, you know, in homebrew, you, you just need to be at boiling temperature and then you could stir it and that would do kind of the same thing. You know, the, the, the extract. So here's, here's the one thing that kind of changes when you're doing, uh, you know, large batch, uh, uh, you know, of, of a homebrew recipe is that, you know, a commercial brewery, uh, may have a more efficient extraction than you do in your home brewery. Doesn't mean it's better. It means that there's a there's an adjustment to be made on that recipe, and the adjustment to be made for made for uh, extraction efficiency is that uh, you need to adjust the base malt up or down generally, um, and not adjust the other things. So that's one type of scaling. If you're trying to scale, let's say you're trying to take a recipe that uh, you have a a session IPA that you want to make into a triple IPA and there's some crystal malt in it. You don't just multiply everything up to the the higher gravity thing. You would increase, you you need to be very careful because if you, if you have a a 4% beer with, you know, 3% crystal malt and you make a 12% beer, you, you don't want, uh, you know, a 9% crystal malt. It's going to be might not want three. It's gonna gonna be syrupy sweet, right? You may not want three. You may want one because uh, you know, as a percentage of the grist, it's going to be a substantially more crystal malt. And you know, the thing about ABV is that's mainly done off of base malt. Um, you don't really want to do it off of the specialty malts. Uh, so that's my rant. What do you What do you guys say? Two things. Um... I've brewed from five to 50 gallons personally, and all I've ever done is scale. Um, the only concern I've ever had is efficiency because that affects flavor a bit. Um, and I expect, and, and, and gentlemen asked, I can, I can call our listeners gentlemen, can I? The, uh, the gentleman asked about homebrew scale size. I don't think there's an issue there. Um, I, I don't scale my recipes for programs, luckily. The person who knows that equipment does. And when I provide my recipes to them, I provide them with my expected efficiencies on mash and brew house. So they know how much work I waste and they know how well my mash runs. And, and they adjust that to their brew house. The, the few programs I've had. My rant would be uh, for this individual, as long as you're not changing the style, you have nothing to worry about except for the proportional difference between the two volumes. Just multiply everything by the the volume you want divided by the volume of the recipe that you have. Multiply that through on everything. You'll be fine. Second thing, like Jamil was saying, once you start getting into different equipment, different, um, you know, if you, if you made your beer on a, a single vessel uh, Brewzilla and you go to brew it on a, a three vessel, you know, traditional brew house, yeah, you're going to need to maybe take into consideration some flavor impacts. but I just want to reiterate to the actual question that going from five to two and a half, that's half, use half the ingredients, half the yeast, half the hops, half the yeast, or half the malts, everything half, you'll be great. I would recommend getting a calculator, uh, like a, like, you know, a Bruce Smith or something and, and divide by two. And div- <laughs> yeah. Times one half divide. You by may two. find one on your phone. Yes. Anyways, I, uh, what was I saying? They totally <laughs> derail, <laughs> uh, I would get a uh, all right. I would get a a nice calculator, brewing recipe calculator that you could. If uh, you're changing styles and volumes and or things like that, you could, you know, make those adjustments. I thought you meant like the old TI calculator, you know, <laughs> TI scientific calculator. Divide two. There you all go. Right. <laughs> Full circle. Just to, <laughs> it's half. Yeah, divide by two. You're good. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Billy asks uh, about water. He says, where is a good reference for the desired water profile per beer type or beer SRM for a printable reference? Also, which water testing systems is tried and true 
for understanding my water to build a desired brewing water profile per beer I'm going to brew. <laughs> yes. Uh, In the back. Y- y- yes, sir. I, I have some things to say. Um, so for your water that you get out of your tap, you can contact your water company and ask for a water report. Don't ask for the regular one everybody gets. You, you can ask for the actual one that you would want for, for brewing. Usually the, the water companies are also tracking the same constituents and they can get that to you. If not, I use the Lamont Brew Lab. Once upon a time, this brew, this podcast had them as a sponsor. It's a fantastic product. I use it every quarter to yeah. check my my tap water. Um, yeah. What was the first question? We we used the the Lamont at uh, uh, at Heretic the the pro pro version of it. Yeah, it was excellent. I have the plus. I mean, it, <laughs> there you go. So there you go. I'm not sure which is better. Um, Yours. Do you have the note? Uh, <laughs> do you have the ultra? <laughs> the, the difference, I think, was only it had a very good pH meter with yours. No, he had a DO. Uh, I have the pH too. He had, he got the DO meter, the probe, which was dope uh, for doing. Uh, but okay, um, the first question was on styles for the water profiles. Where 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 is a good reference for the desired water profile per beer type or beer SRM for a printable reference? So how to brew covers some of them. I use, but I don't think. He, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, he goes in depth there and. There is the water book, but that might be more than somebody might be looking for. It's not a quick reference. Now, there's also, I don't, I couldn't find it on Android, but on iPhone, there's the Palmer water adjustment app. He actually has his own app and it has every style that was in the BJCP 2008. So it is a little dated. It's not going to have like hazy in there, but uh, yeah. And then he also has, yeah, like the, the Adam just noted in the chat that there's also um, the spreadsheets that, that are that the, the app are designed off of are available online, and those have all of the different uh, water profiles. Keeping in mind that it's whatever you want to do. I mean, there's the style, you know, kind of starting point. But if you want to modify the flavor any which way, you can certainly right. do that and not. It's like seasoning yeah. your food. You may want a little more salt or a little less pepper or whatever it would be, you know. So. However, you're cooking your beer, you would you would adjust from that. And I will say, at some point, there's another brewing classic styles coming out, and that will have all the water profiles in it. Oh, very nice, awesome. So we're working on that. All right, one last break, one quick break, and we will finish up. We'll be back right after this. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like. Wine guys, brew strong. All right, we're back. You're listening to Brew Strong, sponsored by Blickman Engineering. You check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. Uh, they've been sponsoring this show for 16 years or so, so you do not have to pay for it. Uh, I would, you know, if you have a little bit of time, um, uh, you know, just rattle off a quick email to feedback at Blickman. BlickmanEngineering.com and uh, tell them know how much you appreciate that they they sponsor the show and chances are they'll keep doing it. So um, yeah, please rattle off that email right away. I'm, I'm wondering who's checking the email and maybe we should flood it before they find it again. <laughs> and so then when the new when the new uh, managers, runners, owners uh, get that email inbox, all of a sudden, bam! You know that would be like wow. Wonders. Yeah. All right. So, so if all three of you were to uh, send an email, I would blood it. Uh, Casey asked for some travel recommendations. She says, hi, Jamel. I've been listening to the BN for what seems like forever. And first want to say thanks for all the good info you have provided over the years. I can't tell you how many times I've referred to Brewing Classic Styles or a recipe you guys covered in Can You Brew It? I'm still very proud of what we did on mm-hmm. Can You Brew It. Uh, last week I was listening to the show with tips and recommendations on traveling to England and you offered, uh, comments about Cologne and Dusseldorf, uh, caught my attention. I have a trip to Europe planned this summer, including three days in Cologne and a day trip to Dusseldorf. If you have any specific suggestions, recommendations about Kolsch or alt beers, I absolutely can't miss or anything else about either city. I'd love to hear them. Uh, let's see. This isn't a question for the show, really. More a question for you as an experienced traveler. Thanks in advance. Um, all right. Uh, Cologne is nice. 
Cologne. Uh, the cathedral is amazing. Yeah, Cologne Dome, absolutely. Yeah, the the beer is okay. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, there's I, I mean, technically, I think there's only like two breweries that are still operating Cologne. Maybe there's some new startups or something, but um, they brew like the five Kolsch's that you'll find, and you can t- you can try all of them within two hours just walking around a little circle um right next to the to the uh the cathedral there that's a nice town uh but i would prefer to stay in dusseldorf myself um dusseldorf is more my kind of town it's uh better beer better food um nicer people i mean there's nice people in cologne but yeah dusseldorf's a little more blue collar i don't know um uh, and, and, and the beer is excellent. And there you have, uh, five, uh, alt breweries still in the city center there in, in Dusseldorf and making some amazing beer. And, um, you know, it's different enough that you can actually taste the differences. They're not all made mm-hmm. at, you know, uh, one of two breweries or anything right. like that. Jamil, do you know that that's like, uh, LSU versus Alabama? Yes, I know. You're they, gonna get some hate. Yeah, yeah, I was worried about yes, that. Yes, there is some hatred there, but yes. you know, some I'm, 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 meals. I'm, 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 I'm a Dusseldorf guy. Oh. Me too, but anyway. I'm, I am declaring <laughs> I am a, I'm a Dusseldorf guy. It's okay. it's truly fantastic. Um, uh, you know what's what's the recommendations? Uh, one recommendation would be grab a, a, a back issue of BYO. I just just recently. Uh, did a uh, article about uh, Dusseldorf and uh, brewing uh, the Sticka Sticka and uh, Latzen beer uh, special releases. And in there, I, I put some uh, recommendations on uh, if you're traveling to to Dusseldorf. Uh, if you're there from the from the main Hauptbahnhof, uh, the main train station, you can just walk to Schumacher. Um, that's about like a five minute walk, maybe 10 minute walk. Uh, and Schumacher, uh, just fantastic beer, fantastic. Say hi to, uh, Fabio for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you won't be disappointed. Uh, from there, you can walk to the Altstadt. It's another 10 minute, 15 minute walk to the Altstadt. And then there's the other four uh, uh, true alt beer brewers. Uh, you can just walk uh, Erge, uh, uh, Kurzer, uh, uh, Schlüssel, uh, probably my absolute favorite. Um, Schumacher and Schlüssel both are just fantastic. Um, Do you pronounce the one on the river differently than I read it? I say Jürgen, and you said Erge. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because I I had been saying it wrong. Uh, I don't know. That's just what uh, the German people in Dusseldorf said. So. That's probably correct. Then that's, that's probably saying. Yeah. Uh, and right right. The river they so they beautiful. may they may have been just joshing me they as the rube, rube from America. They might have um, a different name other than Josh. Josh isn't so very German. They might have been <laughs> Josephine. Uh, I mean, Michelin, yeah. I don't know. I've been. Yeah. I've been you were getting Werner. I, I've been to. I, I've I've spent quite a bit of time now in Dusseldorf, <laughs> surprisingly, not because time. I, 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 I wanted to be for all the special releases, um, and uh, uh, you know, but it, it's fantastic. And after you do that, you can take the uh, the metro uh, back from uh, from there in the all shot to the, the the main train station. It it takes just a couple of minutes. It's yeah. it's like two stops and you're there a couple of bucks and uh it's very clean efficient uh runs every few minutes uh it takes you right back down there and the only reason i'm not saying you know train station down to the alt stop and back you, you have to hit schumacher you, you cannot skip schumacher um but all these just beautiful beautiful places and uh fantastic beer uh you know so check them out there's other there's other stuff around Dusseldorf to see. Uh, like I said, it's a beautiful town and uh, great people. And Cologne's wonderful, too. And yes. you know, do your day trip and, and check out Cologne Dome, the cathedral. Right. It's amazing. Then come on back to Elstad, you know. <laughs> right. That's, see, well, here's the other thing is 
Uh, most of the places in Dusseldorf, and some of them open around 11 or noon, but uh, most of Dusseldorf does not really get cracking until like three in the afternoon. Uh, whereas in Cologne, stuff is open during the day. So you stay in Dusseldorf and travel to Cologne on the train. Uh, and, um, the, uh, you know, you can, you can do all your stuff there during the day. You could be done with all the, the Kolsch tasting by like 11 o'clock in the morning. And, then, you know, but there's other tourist things to do there. Cologne's very beautiful. And then, you know, when you return to Dusseldorf in the evening, Dusseldorf's cracking, you know, and then you can hit everything in the evening. Um, one other the, tip they is the knuckles going through the rotisserie. Oh, man. The, 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 the pork knuckles are tremendous. And, and, yeah. um, but one other thing is the train between Cologne and Dusseldorf, uh, takes like less than 30 minutes unless you pick the slow train. So there's, you know, it seems like the same train, uh, but it'll take, 90 minutes instead of 30 or 20, right? So just be sure that the one you're getting on and Google knows the difference. Uh, cause you know, you'll be like, Oh, you know, this train's going to the same place. Uh, yeah, but it stops at every little spot on the track that somebody could climb off of the train. <laughs> so you want the express. Yeah. You want it's, the quick one. That's not the German word, but you want the word, the German word right. for express is what you want. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Google will tell you, uh, but you know, just make sure you're getting on the right train. Uh, but yeah, you know, that whole area of Germany is just, just fantastic. You know, the people are wonderful. The food's wonderful. The beer's wonderful. It's just, you know, uh, you really can't go wrong. It's, it's a, a, a wonderful place to be. Yeah. I, everybody who loves beer should, should give it a try. Um, I, I wouldn't miss it. Anything else? Sam? I want to go. Go. You want to yeah, go? yeah. Seriously, you want to get a halt stat? You do. Uh, to do, uh, do I love halt beer, so yeah. yeah. Bucket list. Yeah, I'm going again Wait. in uh, yeah. I think in September. I'm going to be through there again. The guy at uh, Schumacher said, "Hey, come by. I'll give you a give you a personal tour." I'm like, "All right." So I, I thought when I went, Jamil, and that was about 2013. I thought there were seven to eight still in the halt stat area. You're telling me there's about five now, and it's kind of sad. There's technically if, five. Yeah. So. Th- there are seven to eight that purport to make alt beer, but they don't actually brew alt beer in Dusseldorf. Okay. So most of the ones I went to, it was like a year ago, I was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, one or two was like, oh, no, the brewery's across the street and it's closed right now. Uh, it might have been that I went to one or two that were fooling me and their brewery was not in alt stock or not in alt stock anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, some of them got purchased. Uh, okay. And so they're, they're, you know, so now it's like a conglomerate that owns it. Maybe they're, you know, still brand, but if you want to be purists, there's five. So still five independents. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh pretty fantastic. All right. You know what else is fantastic? Blickman engineering, check them out. Blickmanengineering.com. Please send them a, uh, a kind email telling them, thank you for sponsoring the show. Uh, even if you think the show sucks. Yes. Come on. Uh, buy a beer gun. Blow some smoke up Buy ahead. a beer gun. Yeah. If you don't have one, you need one. Do so. Buy a beer gun. Right. Yes. That's do. true. You, you really should have a beer gun. I mean, how, you know, unless you're buying like a canning machine, yeah. you should still buy <laughs> a beer right gun. There, like, yeah. Even if you're buying a canner, you should still have a beer gun to fill the cans. I do. Right, I do beer on. gun with cans at my house. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love it. Well, we'll have to do a packaging show now. I'm in. All right. No? Yes? Actually, I think you can. All right. There's a canner off in the distance. People with their fancy gear. Oh. Yeah, I'm I'm filling filling casks. I'm open fermenting and filling casks. I'm I'm a old that sounds fancier actually. Doing beer engines. I you know I don't have this new modern technology. You can get a can anywhere. Get technology you can't from, get a beer engine anywhere. I got technology from 150 years ago. Thank you all for listening. Uh, like I said, if you have questions. Uh, send them in to uh, Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. And then those people who listened live, they got their questions answered pretty much immediately. Uh, so uh, tune in if you get a chance. We post on social media. It's generally uh, Wednesdays at, at 6.30 uh, p.m. Pacific time, uh, which Wednesday changes, but uh, we've we've been sticking to Wednesdays at 6.30 to uh, 
make it easy for everybody. So we'll continue to do that for the foreseeable future until Travis moves or Michael gets a different job. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. Yeah, I'll be here. All right. <laughs> as long as you have. <laughs> until then, until then, everybody. Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong.